Good evening, Crossroads family. Before we get started today, I'd like to make one announcement, and it's actually kind of a divine announcement. God loves you. I want to say that God loves you. You see, the Bible tells us that God loves us so much that he gave us his only son. The Bible tells us that there is nothing that will separate us from God's love. You know, and all too often, we, we don't really experience God's love. And, I, and I, we experience, I'm not saying we don't experience it. What I'm saying is we let our lives defeat us all too often. We let our sin just pile up on us. We, we let sometimes the conduct of our characters just overwhelm us. And we think that God can never love us, that God can't love us enough. And the Bible tells us that God is greater than our sin. He's greater than our heart that fails, David prayed. God loves us so much, and he's greater than, than our sins, than our past. And we remember last week, Pastor Joe talked about that in the book of Hebrews, where he discussed that the whole business of the book is about God being greater, God being greater than the angels, God being greater than all the men who live in this hall of faith that we're discussing today. And this concept of God being greater than our sins was, was even an expression of who we're going to talk about today. And if you have a Bible with me, flip over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. Because we see right here, by faith, Jacob, immediately, right there, Jacob. Jacob, known as a schemer, known as a cheater. He was a, a, a cheater to receive his birthright. And yet, He's placed in the hall of faith. God was greater than Jacob's sins. And by faith, when, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Now I'm going to give you a little background here. We're talking about Genesis 48. Genesis chapter 48, where Jacob tells Joseph, he, he summons both of the sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. And he says he, he, first of all, he says he wants to adopt them. Adopt them as though they were his firstborn sons, Reuben and Simeon, who were actually Jacob's firstborn sons. But we, knew, we know that they um, displeased Jacob. We're told in, in 1 Chronicles 5, regarding Reuben's life, that he lost his birthright because he defiled his father's bed. In Genesis 35, we read that Reuben laid with one of Jacob's concubines. And so Jacob was displeased with Reuben and Simeon. And so he wanted to adopt Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And we're told in Genesis 48 that Joseph brings his two sons to Jacob, and he deliberately grabs Jacob's right hand and places it on Manasseh's left shoulder or near his left hand and he grabs uh, Jacob's left hand and places it on Manasseh's right shoulder or right hand. That's because Manasseh was the elder of the two. Well when he did that Jacob switched his hands and he gave the birthright or the blessing the, the more prominent blessing to the younger son. He gave it to Ephraim instead of Manasseh. Now we see that all throughout scripture right where the the younger by nature was given preeminence, given the firstborn um, by blessing. We see it happen in Isaac's life. Ishmael was technically the older son, yet Isaac was considered the, given the birthright. It happened in Jacob's own life. Jacob swindled Isaac, basically, uh, over Esau to receive the blessing. But more importantly, when I say God is greater as I, as I open this message, it happens in Jesus' own life. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that he was the firstborn. Not that he was the first created. We know that you don't have to be naturally the firstborn to have that title. We see that happen in David's life. David was the, the youngest of all of, of his sons, his seven brothers were all older than him. And yet we're told in 1 Samuel 16 that he was given the birthright. He was given preeminence over his brothers. Like I said, you, you don't have to naturally be the firstborn to receive that firstborn uh, blessing. And Jesus 
according to Colossians 1.15, is given that preeminence, given that firstbornship. Because we know that the first Adam messed up his inheritance, basically. And according to Romans 5, Jesus is given that preeminent birthright. He is better than the second Adam. And Jesus, that's what we're told throughout this whole uh, book of Hebrews, that Jesus is greater. It all points to Jesus. The last couple of verses that we've discussed from uh, Hebrews 11, verse 17, talks about Isaac, who is kind of a type of Jesus. And we see there that Jesus uh, or that Isaac is re- preferred before Ishmael, just like Jesus is preferred before Adam. Jesus is greater than Adam. And so that's the background of what we're talking about here in verse 21. It comes from Genesis 48, where Jacob is blessing both the sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. So now that we have the background, let's go and, and unpack this verse here, verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. What I want to point out first is is there's an interesting concept here, and and follow with me. When he was dying, worshipped. Jacob is on his deathbed, and on his deathbed he's described as worshipping. Described as worshiping God. I love that concept. Um, I remember Billy Graham once said in a crusade that he has talked to nurses and doctors who have held the hands of dying people. And he said that their approach to death is just as distinct as heaven and hell. Between non-believers and non-Christians, their approach to death is just as distinct as heaven and hell. He said, one approaches saying, amen. The other approaches saying, oh man. And we see here that the genuine mark of a believer is how they approach death. How a believer approaches death. Because are they like Paul, who is saying, for me to die is gain? To, to, to behold Christ after I die is gain? And we see that that was Jacob's heart here. When he was dying, he worshipped. He worshipped God. Now, as I was studying this, I, I came across something interesting. That You know, when you're studying the Scripture, something just pops out at you. And if you'll turn with me to Genesis 48, I, I want to read the blessing that he gives to, these, to his two uh, grandsons. And uh, ver- Genesis 48 Verse 16, I'm going to pick up in verse 16. He says, The angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name, or, and let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Uh, we see that come to fruition in uh, Joshua 16 and 17, that they both become a multitude among the children of Israel. And they actually become uh, um, one of the most prominent military tribes among the nations. Uh, Ephraim actually does, where he becomes, in the book of Judges, the, the tribe of Ephraim becomes known for their militant spirit. We even see that take place even before Judges with Joshua. Um, we're told in Numbers 13, when Joshua was sent out as one of the spies, his name was Hoshea first, the son of Nun of the tribe of, of Ephraim. Joshua was a warrior. And when he took over the land of Canaan, we see that uh, Ephraim militant spirit uh, upon him. And we see it throughout the book of Judges where they were right there with Gideon. They, they completely were just a militant tribe. And, and they because of that, that led to their them multiplying, Ephraim and Manasseh. But what I want to point out about this verse in in Genesis 48 is, let my name be upon them. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 22, verse 1, that a good name is better to be chosen than choice silver. A good name is to be better chosen than choice silver. We see that throughout the Scriptures. You know, and something we actually see is we see God is in the business of changing names. 
You ever notice that? He changes Abraham's name. It was Abram, and then he changes it to Abraham, the father of many nations. He changes Peter's name. When Peter expressed who he was, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus responds to him in Matthew 16. You, you are, no, the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Simon Barjona, but you shall be called Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. God was in the business of changing names because your name often describes your purpose, your meaning in life, who you are. It's been said that you'll discover in life that you go by three names. The name that your parents give you, the name that others call you, and the name that God gives you, the name that you give yourself, that name that comes upon you. And what is that name? Follower, disciple. Acts chapter 11, verse 26 says it's Christian. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Why? Because they observed who they were. And in observing who they were, it identified them with Christ. Your name is your identity. Who you are in Christ. You are a Christian. And that is the new name that God gives you. He gives you the name of Son of God, Daughter of God. He gives you a new name when you come to Him. And when we understand, when we recognize the name that God has given us, a Son of God, a child of God, a daughter of God, when we recognize that name, we become transformed in our lives. That, that name remakes who we are in our separation to the world. We want to become Christ-like. It identifies who we are. You know, and it spoke to me as a father where you see here a grandfather is blessing his children and what name, what, what reputation is he passing on to him? He's passing on to him that I, that we serve, that my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, served the God of Israel. They served the only true God. That was their identity. That was who they are as a Hebrew nation. They were separate from the rest of the world. And that's the name that he's passing on to his children, to his grandchildren. It made me just think as an application to my life, what name am I passing on to my children? Am I passing on a name of, of being a man after God's own heart, being a man who serves the God of Israel all the days of his life? Is that the identity that I am giving my kids? Is that what is being passed on? What name is being passed on in my life? I flip back over to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verse 12, verse 21, I'm sorry. He blessed each of the sons of Joseph. Now I don't want you to miss this because we just got done talking about names. You see God's name, God took his name or God does take his name very seriously. We know that from the, the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for he will not hold him guiltless who does so. God takes his name very seriously. Now, real quick, uh, taking the name of God in vain is, you know, in our culture, we've kind of almost made it superstitious, if you will, where to say, oh my God, we're thinking that God won't help hold us that God will hold us uh, accountable for saying, oh my God. And, and I'm not saying to say that. I definitely wouldn't advise taking the Lord's name in that way in vain, using his name um, as an expression like that. But I also want to say don't become superstitious because that's not exactly what that commandment is really alluding to. That commandment has a, a, a greater sense to it. And the idea is, even today, we can see the sense that it has, is that when you claim that name, when you pray by that name, when you say you identify that name and continually live in disobedience of what God has commanded, you're taking his name in vain. That's that idea of taking the Lord's name in vain. By saying that we identify with him, that is our name too, Christian, and yet not living out his commandments. We are taking his name in in vain. And we see that with Jesus. Many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, and I will say, depart from them, I never knew you. They took the Lord's name in vain. We see how powerful 
the name of God is. We're told to pray in the name of Jesus. Whatever you ask in my name, it shall be done for you. Paul, in almost a doxology, um, tells us in Philippians 2 that when Jesus died and became obedient to the point of death, that he was, therefore, he was given the name above all names. That, at, that, at, that every tongue should confess of those on heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name is powerful. His name is to be held in reverence. And yet, we're told in Psalm 138, verse 2, that God magnifies his word even above his own name. God magnifies his word even above his own name. And now, now catch me here. Uh, stay with me here as I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this little phrase again to you. When he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. Blessed each of the sons of Joseph. The word blessed there is, um, is the Greek word um, yugo, eulogeo. Eulogeo. Now, you might track where I'm going with this. You might get the origin of one of our English words, but you'll better get it if you spell it out. It's, it's spelled E-U-L-O-G-E-O. E-U-L-O-G-E-O. And it is where we get our English word, eulogy. So when he blessed them, it's where we get our English word, eulogy. The word is actually a Greek combination of two words, eu, which means good, and logos, which means word. And so the word blessed literally means good word. They spoke a good word. He spoke a good word. Oftentimes in Scripture, the word is used to describe a good, a positive, an encouraging, a word of praise. I find that fascinating because God places his word above his own name. And sometimes we don't place our words above our own name. If you catch where I'm going with that, sometimes our words don't express really our identity, don't express really who we are. You see, our words are exceptionally important. God puts, put, God puts a great emphasis upon our words. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but what is necessary for edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. He puts such an emphasis on our words that he tells us that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, that no idle word, that every idle word we will give an account for. Every idle word, that Greek word there is argos, literally means free from labor, lazy. In other words, Jesus is saying, think before you speak. Think before you speak. Don't speak in a lazy manner. Don't speak in a manner that is free from labor of thought. You see, because we live in a culture that doesn't do that. I mean, if you think about it, you know, Here's a fact. Psychology, psychologists say that for every negative word spoken, it takes 20 words to combat that. Every, they, they say that every one negative word that is spoken, it takes 20 words, uh, 20 positive words to combat that negativity. We live in a culture that's free from labor when it comes to what we say when it comes to how we speak. So much so that how many of us can say that we're proficient in the colloquial defilement of sarcasm? Many of us can say we are proficient in sarcasm. I'm not knocking sarcasm. Sarcasm is good when it enlivens a conversation, when it's not directed at somebody, but all too often sarcasm is used as hostility under the guise of humor. We've all been subject to that, where it becomes hostility under the guise of humor, sarcasm. Sarcasm, did you know, comes from the Greek word, sarkenzen, 
the Greek word sarkinzin. You, you, if, you, if you know anything about the Greek language, you'll realize that the first part of that word is sarkos. It means the word flesh. The word sarkinzin literally means tearing flesh. Sarcasm has the origin of that word, tearing flesh. And how many of us have ever been victims of that? Where sarcasm is used as, a, as hostility under the guise of humor, but it literally tears our flesh. It digs deep into us. That's because our words have power. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue. We're told in James chapter 3, I love this because it kind of goes back to that concept of taking the Lord's name in vain. Let not many of us become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And then the rest of that chapter pretty much goes on about how you speak. In other words, James is kind of saying, don't let your words be empty. Your words must back up or, or your lifestyle must back up your words. And God places a great emphasis upon our words. Carl Sandburg, he, he wrote a, bi a, a document, uh, I'm sorry, a biography on Abraham Lincoln. And he wrote in there, be careful with your words. For once they are said, they can only be forgiven, not forgotten. We have to be careful with our words. What we say can cut people down. What we, even, even as I mentioned, in that concept of sarcasm. God magnifies his word above his own name. We should magnify our words above our name. Just because we're called a Christian, sometimes we don't speak like one. And sometimes, even in our own lives, this goes to us, ourselves. We need to also be careful of what we speak to ourselves. Because if you think about it, sometimes we speak negativity to ourselves. And Paul talks about that in, in um, Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 8 and 9. You know, meditate on that which is good, trustworthy, lovely, of good report. Because when we're meditating on those things, we won't be speaking negatively to ourselves. And sometimes it's good to talk to ourselves. It's good to encourage ourselves in the Lord. David did it all throughout the Psalms. And perhaps the most um, one that sticks out is Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless the Lord. Forget not his benefits. Who, he who forgives all our iniquities. David had to talk to himself in the Lord. He had to say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Because there was power in his words. There was power in the encouragement that he gave himself. Sometimes you will find power in your life in the words that you speak to yourself. When you are speaking scripture to yourself. I know there's many times when I've been in a situation that just seems kind of down or dark or whatever it is, and I speak a, a word of Scripture to myself. I, I say, bless the Lord, O my soul. That I, I, My spirit gets lifted up. You know, but it's sad because in the culture that we live in, words just, first of all, they're just so, sometimes they're so mean. You know, we, we live in a culture where, where you know, we've grown up hearing the expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt. And whoever said that lied. Because words do hurt. Words do have meaning to them that hurts. And, 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 and you know, I, personally, I love, if you ask my wife or anybody that knows me well enough, I love to compliment people. It, it's just something I like to do. I think maybe because I'm a words of affirmation person myself, so I love to give a compliment to somebody. And, you know, I've discovered, because, I, you know, I, you look at it, and it's uh, Proverbs 16, verse 24, tells us that a kind word is like honey, sweet to the soul and health to the bones, health to the body. But I realize, as I compliment people, some people take it weird. When you compliment somebody sometimes in this culture that we live in, some people take it as strange or odd, or they feel a little contempt toward that, or they feel as if, you know, you... you, you They've got, you know, you're scratching their back. They got to they gotta give you something. They got to, you know, you scratch their back. They got to scratch your back kind of concept. And, and people take it so strange a compliment in the day that we live in because words have become so hostile in the culture that we live in. And it's unfortunate that that has happened. 
But we as believers should go beyond that. You know, if you ever travel to Hawaii or, or Texas, you travel to some of these places. Hawaii literally calls it the aloha spirit, right? Texas calls it the southern hospitality. And the way that these people speak to each other, you can almost feel a different presence there. And how much so should we as Christians be leading the charge of the way we speak? How much so should a different character and presence be on us by the way that we speak? And more so, the way that we speak to God. And I'm not talking about just disrespecting God or, you know, as we alluded to, saying, oh my God, or taking his name in vain. I'm talking about our prayer life. How we speak to God. When we speak to God. Those are the most important words that we speak as human beings. What we say to God. And all too often we get a little discouraged with our prayer life because we think, you know, I don't know how to pray. I don't pray that very well. I'm not very eloquent in my prayers. I'll admit to you, I'm not eloquent in my prayers at all. If you penned my prayers, they'd probably be terrible. But it's not about how eloquent your prayers. It's about your heart in the prayer. Sometimes I don't, I don't pray long enough. It's not about the longing. or the, It's not about how long your prayers. It's about the longing in your prayer. God sees behind our words. He sees our hearts. Jesus even alluded to that concept in a negative sense in Matthew 15, verse 8. These people draw unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lip, but their heart is far from me. When we speak, our words should match our heart. Our heart should match our words. And that is very of utmost importance because God magnifies his word above his own name. Now come back with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. Finishing it off with this last phrase here, leaning on the top of his staff. Leaning on the top of his staff. So you got to put yourself into a mental picture here. Jacob is dying. He's on his deathbed. It says that he blesses Manasseh and Ephraim, the two sons of Joseph. Then he worshiped. Then he leaned on the top of his staff. And why is that? Why did Paul, I'm going to say it because I believe he's the writer of Hebrews, why did he say leaning on the top of his staff? Why did he feel it necessary to add that phrase there? I think because if we remember, God dislocated Jacob. In Genesis 32, he wrestled with God and God popped his hip out of place. He dislocated him. And we know that a staff in Scripture is symbolic for rulership or authority. We remember the famous uh, uh, chapter, Exodus 16. Moses stretched out your hand and he divided, stretched out your hand with the staff and he divided the, the ocean. It, it, it represented authority. A staff represented authority. And yet, Jacob, in Genesis 13, had his hip popped out of place by God. He was dislocated by God. And so I imagine that staff for him became a representation of God's authority in his life. I imagine that staff for the rest of his life was an expression of authority. You know, it kind of reminds me of Peter. Um, when Jesus told Peter, you know, right after he, Peter expressed who he was, and then he says, you know, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You have to think about that for a second. Why would Jesus use the most common animal? That's always, that's always just, every time I read that, it makes me think of that. Because I imagine for the rest of Peter's life, waking up, he heard that rooster crow. And I imagine for the rest of his life, it stirred in him a steadfastness to remain faithful to his Lord by hearing that rooster crow, remembering that one night, what he did that one night, and, and remembering it through that rooster every morning. I imagine that's what's going on in Peter's mind. And we as believers, we need to have a staff. We need to have a rooster in our lives. I'll express with you, I'll share with you, mine is my first Bible. I got my first Bible when I was in Bible college. I had always had different Bibles. My parents gave me them. Um, I had a hand-me-down from my dad. I had just, just different Bibles. And this Bible was my first Bible, one I picked out, the one I wanted in Bible college. And when I bought this Bible, I had them embroider the Bible and, and put my name on it. And it took a few days, and I come back to 
to reclaim my Bible. So excited, you know, I got my first Bible with my name on it and a little verse. And as I go, I go and I sit by the lake and I look, you know, I open up my Bible, open up the package, and my name is wrong. So my last name is spelled J-U-A-R-E-Z. It was spelled J-A-U-R-E-Z. And I remember sitting there by the lake thinking, gosh, I was so frustrated that my Bible was spelled wrong. I was, I was mad, you know, that I got, I got to get a new Bible because they messed it up. There's no way they're going to fix that. And as I was sitting there, the Lord just spoke to me, spoke to my heart, not audibly. I didn't hear him. He spoke to my heart. And he said, this book is not about you. This book is not about you. And to this day, I still have that Bible. It's in my office at home. That Bible has become my rooster. It has become my staff of recognizing the authority of God in my life. And I imagine that that is what was taking place in Jacob's life as he's holding that staff, remembering that in Pilnau, he was dislocated when he wrestled with God. And that forever became an expression of God's authority in his life. May that be something that happens to us. May we find, uh, you know, I hope that we find our staff, our rooster, but most importantly, this is our staff. This is our rooster. This is our reminder that we identify, first of all, as the new name that God has given us as Christians, but that our words should express our identity, who we are, because we serve a God who magnifies His Word above His own name. That's always, always just blew me away. Because we don't even know the name of God. We have that the YHWH. We don't have the vowels. Because Jews were afraid to write the vowels out. They never wrote them out. Because His name was so holy. And yet He says, My Word is above My name. Heaven and earth will pass, but my word will by no means pass away. Jesus said not one jot or one tittle will not be fulfilled from my word. And if that's so, if we understand that he's given us that new name, he's given us his word in our hearts, then we would do well to heed to it. And more importantly, we would do well to live it. Amen? Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is a light unto our, path, unto our path, a lamp unto our feet. Lord, but most importantly, your word is what directs us to you, your son Jesus. You told us that you search these the scriptures, for in them you think they have life, but they're that which testify of me. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the book of Hebrews starts off, that our fathers in times past spoke in various ways through the prophets to our fathers, has now spoken us, spoken to us through His Son. Father, we have Your Son, and we can get to know Your Son more through Your Word. I pray, Father, that would be so in all of our lives. Lord, that You would convict us to search Your Word as for buried treasure. Lord, that You would encourage us through Your Word to know, Father, that this life is not the end. That we can, like Jacob, dying or, or be faced with death and still worship you. Knowing, Lord, that that is the mark of a believer. That how we view death, knowing that we shall be in your presence. So, Father, we ask, Lord, that your word would move in power in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.